Hi, Manager of Accounting students. Today we're going to cover Chapter 11, Performance Measurement in Decentralized Organizations. Um, this is kind of a strange chapter, and I mostly blame it on the authors of the text and the authors of the PowerPoint. So before we begin, I want to acknowledge all of these smart people that have apparently spent their time and energy to put together this PowerPoint presentation. Look at all the letters after their names. PhD, CPA, PhD, CPA, CIA. Not that CIA, the other CIA, Sem <laughs> uh, Certified Internal Auditor, another PhD CPA. So these should be highly in intelligent people, right? All right, so keep that in mind as we look at some of the material from Chapter 11. So as we get started, the first concept is decentralization in organizations. And that's similar to the idea of decentralization in our government, talking about um, centralized authority, meaning like federal authority versus states' rights. So when, when we talk about decentralized government, that means spreading the power out to the states, counties, cities. Um, the concept is similar when we talk about a business. Um, does all the power come from the top down or is it spread out among different um, managers and supervisors in different areas of the company? So the idea is that to flatten your pyramid what I mean by pyramid, um, a lot of times we refer to the structure of an organization as a pyramid or a triangle. If it's a very sharp, steep triangle, then all the power is coming from the top and they're pushing it down onto the workers below them. If we flatten out that triangle, we make it this big, wide, spread out, obtuse triangle. The idea is that the managers and supervisors in mid-level in the company have uh, a lot of input and power in terms of decision making and um, that the decision making is shared. And there's definitely some benefits to that concept of decentralization. So it frees up top management to concentrate more on strategy. Um, often lower level decision makers um, have better information. Um, they're dealing with the problems and the successes daily. They see what's going on so they can make decision, decisions based on better information and they might also be able to respond more quickly. So lower level managers can respond more quickly to customers sometimes. Um, next, lower level managers gain experience in decision making. Well, that sounds nice and all, but why does that matter? Well, we're hoping that those lower level managers will stay on and, and grow with the company and become higher level managers eventually. So um, in terms of retaining employees and training people for the future, uh, there is some value in that for both the individuals involved and for the company. And decision-making authority leads to job satisfaction. And again, we kind of say, well, who cares? Is it our goal to make sure that every employee is enjoying their job? No, but what we know is that satisfied employees that value their job are going to work harder and care more about the company and its success. So um, there's definitely something in that for the company as well as the individuals involved. There's potentially also some disadvantages with decentralization. Sometimes lower level managers might make decisions without seeing the big picture. Um, they might be dealing um, with problems or uh, with a customer issue and they might think, well, I need to just you know, make sure this customer is pleased. But if they decide that they need to, uh, for example, refund a customer or give them some huge discount, um, that might keep that customer happy, but the company may have lost money. So it's important that they can, um, you know, make their decisions quickly and respond to customer needs, but they might be doing that without seeing the big picture. There also could be potentially a lack of coordination among autonomous managers. Um, a manager in one area might have a great idea, um, but that may not that may not really coincide with the goals of the organization overall, or it may not work with what maybe another department is doing, which that same concept ties into these next two. Lower level managers' objectives may not be those of the organization. They might just be focused on making sure that their area or their department is successful, and that may not tie in perfectly with the organization's goals. And then finally, it might be difficult to spread innovative ideas. So if one manager has a great idea, but they don't communicate a lot with managers in other areas, it might be difficult to spread that innovative idea throughout the company. Now, all of these problems can be solved, 
these are just potential disadvantages as far as I'm concerned. Um, all of these could be addressed and lower level managers could be informed of what the big picture is. And we could work to make more coordination among autonomous managers. And we can make sure they understand the objectives of the organization and find out ways to communicate and spread innovative ideas throughout the organization. So there's definitely ways to address all of these, especially now that we're aware of them. The next topic, responsibility accounting, we've talked a little bit about before. Um, when we talk about responsibility accounting, it's kind of tying back to the blame game, but not blame in a negative way, but we need to find out if something's going well or if something's not going well. We need to find out who's responsible for that, not so that we can be angry with them, but so that we can solve the problem. We can make adjustments and fix it. So that's what uh, responsibility accounting is all about. And the textbook will go on and on that we need to make sure that we don't blame people or use it as a club. Um, yeah, all of that's true, but ultimately in the business world, somebody has to be responsible. Somebody has to be in charge. There has to be decision makers. We can't all just pass the buck and it's not all rainbows and teddy bears. So when we say responsibility accounting, um, yeah, we do need to find out what went wrong and who's in charge and most importantly, what we're going to do about it to make it better. There's always an opportunity to redeem oneself and fix the glitch. So as we refer to responsibility accounting, um, this concept of responsibility center, we have cost center, profit center, and investment center. So a cost center is a segment whose manager has control over costs, but not over revenues or investment funds. So it would just be, um, I guess, a segment that spends money, but isn't responsible for revenue or investment. So in a large business, for example, there's departments within a large business that may not have any control over earning revenue, making sales, but they have costs. So maybe the shipping department or even the accounting department. We don't make money in accounting departments. We just do a lot of work. Um, we could say the same of uh, human resources. They have responsibility. They have work to do, but they don't bring money in. They support the organization. So a lot of those support type departments would be considered cost centers. A profit center is a segment whose manager has control both over costs and revenues, but no control over investment funds. So this might be um, a department that is responsible for bringing in revenue. So maybe the sales department in an organization and they bring in revenue and they have costs. Um, but big picture, they don't make the high level decisions to control investment funds. So they say, well, we need a new building. We've been selling so much that we need more equipment, more warehouses. We need all this stuff. Well, that's not up to them. So um, a profit center just controls their own revenue and their costs. Whereas an investment center is a segment whose manager has control over costs, revenues, and investments in operating assets. So operating assets, so that means making the big decisions, spending funds for long-term investments in buildings, equipment, trucks, warehouses, all of that. So these are high-level decision makers if we're talking about an investment center. So as we look at the rest of the chapter material, a lot of it is looking at how we choose to invest our funds into operating assets. So the first thing we want to do is compute return on investment, which is called ROI. I know you love all the acronyms, right? We needed more letters in accounting. So we're going to compute ROI and show how changes in sales, expenses, and assets affect ROI. Um, I'm going to forewarn you, the book has a very strong bias against ROI. They seem to think that it is bad and evil, and I can't really get my brain around why, but I think you'll see it through the imagery used in the slides coming up. So first, ROI, um, it's a pretty simple formula. We're gonna take our net operating income, which we might refer to as EBIT. Now, EBIT would stand for earnings before income and taxes, but somehow all those people with the letters after their names put income before interest and taxes. Mm, I think it means about the same thing but we could essentially take our net income at the bottom of an income statement and add back the interest in taxes, and that would give us our net operating income. And then we're gonna divide it by our average operating assets. 
So average operating assets includes cash, accounts receivable, inventory, plant and equipment, and other productive assets. That's kind of vague. Make sure you read in your text what is and is not included in average operating assets. There's a little blurb about that. Please make sure you're reading your book. So not a complicated formula. Net operating income, or NOI, over average operating assets, or AOA. Um, just as a little note, they are reminding us that most companies use the net book value of depreciable assets to calculate average operating assets. So not just the original acquisition costs, they go ahead and subtract the accumulated depreciation to get the book value. So essentially what's showing on the balance sheet. So here we have this brilliant slide called Understanding ROI. Um, it reiterates exactly the same formula that we already knew, ROI, which is net operating income over average operating assets. But then it goes on to explain that, well, we could do it this other way where ROI equals margin times turnover. And we could compute our margin by taking our net operating income divided by sales and then our turnover, which is our sales divided by our average operating assets. And that's supposedly a better way of getting the ROI. Um, I, I wanna clarify a few things here. Net operating income over average operating assets was pretty simple. So I'm not sure why the text is suggesting that we need to learn it this other way. Um, here, I fixed the slide, misunderstanding ROI. I'm back at our original formula, NOI divided by AOA, meaning net operating income divided by average operating assets. So if we take margin times turnover, margin is net operating income over sales, times turnover, which is sales over average operating assets. Well, look what cancels out, sales. It cancels out, which leaves us back at NOI over AOA. So why in the world is the textbook overcomplicating this? I really don't understand it. Um, margin times turnover does not help us understand this any better. Sales has nothing to do with our return on investment. Um, Sales is already accounted for within net operating income, so there's no need to throw it in in the numerator and the denominator and then let them cancel out. Um, it simply doesn't make mathematical sense. Um, so I'm not really gonna humor that. I encourage you to use just simply net operating income over average operating assets. I think all of this overcomplication has to do with the author's dislike of ROI, which I still can't get my brain around. So. Just stick with this basic formula. I think it will serve you well. And I will say that while the authors really dislike ROI, um, it's one of the more considered and looked at computations for a business in terms of decision-making. Return on investment is a big deal. It's not just something that we ignore. So if we wanna increase the ROI, here we're looking at real company and they have the following information, net operating income of 30,000, average operating assets of 200,000, we have sales of 500,000, and operating expenses of 470,000. And they say, what is Regal Company's ROI? They're suggesting here that we need to do margin times turnover. Um, I think we can do it faster than that. If we just take our net operating income and divide it by our average operating assets, what did you get? should look like this, right? Just 30,000 divided by 200,000 because the 500,000s cancel out. So it's just 30 over 200, which is 15%. Um, really not difficult. And again, I see no reason to do margin times turnover. We could do it much faster just doing net operating income over average operating assets. So next, Let's assume that Regal's manager invests in a $30,000 piece of equipment that increases sales by $35,000 while increasing operating expenses by $15,000. So that's a difference. Sales go up $35,000, expenses go up $15,000. So we're making $20,000 more based on a $30,000 investment. Well, we're going to make $20,000 more per year. So it'll pay for itself. But let's look at the numbers here. So now our net operating income is going to go up by 20,000 to 50, 50,000. 
Our new average operating assets is 230,000. And then we have sales and operating expenses, which we honestly don't need. So compute the new ROI. Before I even move to the next slide, can you see what it is? 50,000 divided by 230,000. That's it. And again, they've overcomplicated this concept. 50,000 divided by 230,000 should give you roughly 21.8%, somewhere in that range. Um, so this investment caused our ROI to increase. So that's good. It's a good idea then to make that investment in that piece of equipment. It caused our overall ROI to go up from 15 to 21.8%. So, so far, I don't see any real problems with ROI other than the textbook authors have ridiculously overcomplicated it with margin and turnover. But wait, look at this next slide. Um, yeah, that's pretty weird. This is from the publishers of your textbook. I'm not making this up. Uh, this appears to be a guy with a voodoo doll of himself and he's sticking pins into it. That's a bit concerning. And here we have criticisms of ROI with red darts. We might even interpret that to be blood um, on them. So I'm feeling this strong dislike of ROI suddenly. It's very strange. So they're criticizing ROI. They say in the absence of the balanced scorecard, management may not know how to increase ROI. First of all, we'll talk about a balanced scorecard at the end of the chapter. It's a, it's an, I don't know, a strange concept. I, want, I don't want to call it strange. It's a good concept, but how they present it's a bit strange. But the sentence doesn't even make sense. In the absence of the balanced scorecard, um, with or without a balanced scorecard, uh, management may not know how to increase ROI. Well, I think we're really underestimating management. Let's go back. ROI is net operating income divided by average operating assets. So how would we increase our ROI? Basic math tells us to increase ROI Either net operating income needs to go up, our numerator, and or average operating assets, our denominator, needs to go down. That's it. That's how you increase ROI. Net operating income goes up and or average operating assets goes down. What manager can't figure that out? With or without a balanced scorecard, why could management not know how to increase ROI? It doesn't make sense. Uh, next, they criticize that managers often inherit many committed costs over which they have no control. So there might be some truth to that, but if managers can't control their costs, then who can? We might need to go to a higher level. I would say more specifically, managers might inherit um, assets over which they have no control. Um, we might have all kinds of old assets on our books that are not that productive and that, therefore, that could decrease our ROI. We might be doing everything we can to control costs and generate as much net operating income as we can, but if we have old, um, unproductive assets sitting on our books, that could damage our ROI. So I would say the company needs to put their heads together and figure out what to do. Um, this is a simple matter of communication and problem solving. And lastly, they criticize that managers evaluated on ROI may reject profitable investment opportunities. And here's where the authors just run with this idea that ROI is horrible because managers are stupid and will make bad decisions um, based on, I guess, being motivated by money. And all I would say is that the, they're concerned that managers that are evaluated on ROI might reject profitable investment opportunities, then find a different way to evaluate managers, find a different way to reward them. Um, but ROI is a widely and commonly used measure in business, and we shouldn't ignore it because of these basic complaints that have simple solutions to them. So now what they're going to do, we're going to switch over to a different concept um, called residual income. And you're going to see that the textbook loves residual income. So compute residual income and understand its strengths and weaknesses. 
And for some reason, the authors of the book just love residual income. But I will tell you, residual income is not all that useful and has all kinds of weaknesses and problems, and it's not commonly used in business. So nonetheless, we'll proceed and learn about it. And already we can see a different imagery. There's no blood dripping darts. There's no voodoo dolls. Suddenly we have a man in a hot air balloon. So we're setting a much different tone here. So they tell us net operating income above some minimum return on operating assets. That's what residual income is. So by how much did we exceed our minimum return on operating assets? So the formula residual income equals net operating income minus average operating assets times this minimum required rate of return. So this computation differs from the awful evil ROI is what they're trying to say here. ROI measures net operating income earned relative to the investment in average operating assets, while residual income measures net operating income earned less the minimum required return on average operating assets. So they're both a measure of how productively have we used our assets, how efficient have we been in generating net operating income relative to the amount of assets that we have. And that's an important thing to understand in business. They just, each of these ROI versus RI, residual income, look at it slightly differently. Um, so let's look at an example. The retail division of Zephyr Inc. has average operating assets of 100,000 and is required to earn a return of 20% on these assets. Now remember, this figure 20%, that's their um, required, or their minimum required rate of return. The authors of the text have set this number. So far it appears to be an arbitrary number, but keep in mind, they came up with this number. So in the current period, the division earns 30%, excuse me, $30,000. So to compute our residual income, we take 100,000 times 20%, we get 20,000. So the minimum required return is 20,000. And our actual income was 30,000. So our residual income is 10,000. We've exceeded the minimum required return by 10,000. And of course, here we have somebody uh, striding over a hurdle successfully. I imagine if we were talking about ROI that he would snag his foot on the hurdle and fall on the ground and the runner in the lane next to him would spike him in the shin and there would be blood. But we're just talking about residual income so everything's happy here when we talk about residual income. Oh another happy image. We're gonna water the money tree and everything's gonna be great. So motivation and residual income. Residual income encourages managers to make profitable investment, excuse me, profitable investments that would be rejected by managers using ROI. Um, that's quite a statement. Residual income, so computing residual income rather than ROI, encourages managers to make profitable investments that would be rejected by managers using ROI. Um, I think this is where the authors of the textbook have this major bias and they think that managers are so dumb that they can't figure out how to use ROI and they're ignoring all the many problems that come with residual income that we'll talk about later. They seem to think that residual income is the way to go and they aren't being shy about it. So let's do this quick check together. But do keep in mind that these numbers in here are made up by the authors of the textbook who hate ROI. So, Redmond's awning, a division of Wrap-Up Corp, has net operating income of $60,000 and average operating assets of $300,000. The required rate of return for the company is 15%. Okay, first, keep in mind, the authors made up that percentage. They picked whatever percentage they want and they chose 15% for a reason. So that aside, we don't need that bit of information right now because they just wanna know what is the division's ROI. So how do we compute ROI? Net operating income divided by average operating assets. So what do you come up with? 
hopefully you got D, 20%. So 60 divided by 300 should give you 20%. Notice that our ROI of 20% is higher than their arbitrarily selected required rate of return, which they have at 15%. So just stick that in the back of your mind for a moment. So next, Redmond's awning, same data, net operating income of 60,000, operating assets of 300,000. If the manager of the division is evaluated based on ROI, will she want to make an investment of $100,000 that would generate additional net operating income of $18,000? So doing that, what would that do to our overall ROI? So our net operating income would go from 60,000 up to, we'd add 18,000. So our new net operating income would be 78,000. And then our new average operating assets would be 300 plus 100 would be 400,000. So we'd be taking 78,000 divided by 400,000 and we'd come up with a new ROI of 19.5%. And they're suggesting that the manager of the division is going to reject this investment opportunity because it brings down the ROI from 20% down to 19.5%. And therefore, this must be a bad idea. First of all, as we talk about ROI, managers need to know that anything that has an ROI above a certain amount should be considered and looked at. It's not just, oh, well, it made us go from 20 down to 19.5. 19.5 might still be very good. When the company has a required rate of return of 15%, 19.5 is still looking really good. So I would contend that most managers would say, yeah, this is good. It, it's right in line with what we're doing. So they're saying, no, the manager would decide against this because it brings the ROI down slightly. I disagree. This is the textbook authors hating on ROI for some unknown reason. So let's switch over. Now we're going to look at residual income. So the company's required rate of return is 15%. Would the company want the manager of Redmond Awnings division to make an investment of 100000 that would generate additional net operating income of 18000 per year? And of course, the answer is yes that investment itself would be making 18%, which is higher than 15%, which I'm pretty confident the other manager can do math and would understand that. So um, the ROI on that given investment is 18%, and it brings the that division to 19.5%. I think the company would want the manager to make that investment, and I think the manager would still make that investment. But let's see what it looks like when we do it with residual income. So the required rate of return is 15%. What is the division's residual income? So we're going to take our um, 300,000 times 15%. And we want to know by how much does our net operating income of 60,000 exceed that required return? Hopefully you came up with C, 15,000. So 15% 15 of 300,000 is 45,000. And we have net operating income of 60,000. So that leaves us with residual income of 15,000. So that's our residual income. And then if uh, we take on this other investment that costs $100,000 and it's going to generate another $18,000 per year, Will a manager evaluated based on residual income want to do that? So what will that do overall? So our assets are going to go up to 400,000 and our net operating income is going to go up to 78,000. So 15% of 400,000 is 60,000 and we're making 78,000. So we have residual income of 18,000. So our residual income has increased. So I think the manager evaluated on residual income, of course, will want to do this. Anybody can see that this project yields 18%, right? 18 divided by 100 is 18%. And if the company's required rate of return is 15%, then this investment seems like a good idea. Do keep in mind that the numbers in this quick check problem are all set up by the authors of the text that really hate ROI. So we started with an ROI of 
while they chose a required rate of return of 15% and they dreamed up this project in, in between that makes 18%. So they're trying to set up the data to make the manager evaluated on ROI make bad decisions. But I think most educated managers aren't going to go for that and they see that a project that yields 18% and brings the division ROI to 19.5% is still going to make the right choice here. But that's just me. My other suggestion would be maybe management shouldn't only evaluate the manager on ROI. That's their own fault. So, oh, they do want to bring up this one one, oh, one major disadvantage of residual income, and it is a major one. It cannot be used to compare the performance of divisions of different sizes. So residual income is incredibly limited in its usefulness. It can only be used to compare something of the same size. So let's take a look here. We're back at Zephyr Inc. and we're looking at the retail division and the wholesale division. So in the retail division, we have $100,000 of operating assets times our required rate of return, which apparently now is 20%. And we get a minimum required return of 20,000. In the wholesale division, which is apparently much larger, we have a million dollars of assets and we multiply it by 20%. And so their minimum required return is 200,000. So then we look at their actual income and retail has 30,000 and wholesale has 220,000. We subtract the minimum required return, 20,000 under retail, 200,000 under wholesale, and they both have positive residual income. So that's good. But the question becomes, which one did better? They both exceeded their minimum required return, but which one did better? Well, residual income on its own is not going to tell you that because we're dealing with divisions of very different size. So it's really not that useful here. So residual income numbers suggest that the wholesale division outperformed the retail division because its residual income is $10,000 higher. So a lot of people would look at this and say, well, it has higher residual income, it's doing better. However, the retail division earned an ROI. Oh, they're back to ROI, which they claimed was not good. An ROI of 30% compared to an ROI of 22% for the wholesale division. The wholesale division's residual income is larger than retail simply because it's a, lar a larger division. So if we were to compute this mathematically, what we'd see is that um, the retail division has residual income of 10,000, which is 50% over the minimum required return. That's huge. Where the wholesale division, with their residual income of 20,000, they've only exceeded their minimum required return by 10%. So if we look at it in percentages, we might get a better idea. But in fact, the retail division did better. And even our textbook authors who hate ROI used ROI to show the flaws with residual income. So that's all on ROI and residual income. Um, I think what you'll find in the real world is that ROI is used and residual income is not, despite what the authors of your textbook and these lovely PowerPoint slides suggest. ROI is not evil. It's commonly understood and commonly used, and it doesn't need to be overcomplicated with margin times turnover. Just stick with net operating income divided by average operating assets. Um, in terms of residual income, you will have one or two questions on your test about residual income, so you need to know how to compute it. But beyond that, I suspect you'll probably never use it again because people in the real world don't use that. So our next topic, we need to learn to compute throughput time, delivery cycle time, and manufacturing cycle efficiency, which is MCE for short. So in understanding that, a few terms we need to learn. Um, so here's the idea. From the time that the order is received, so a business receives an order, the time between when that order is received and we actually start production is what we refer to as wait time. Then once we start production, that includes processing time, inspection time, move time, and queue time. 
to the time that those goods are shipped, overall, we refer to that as throughput time. And the whole thing from the time the order is received to when the order is shipped is our total delivery cycle time. And this is an important note down here. Process time is the only value added time. So just this, just this process time there, that is our only value added time. Inspection time, move time, and queue time don't actually add value, but they're all part of our throughput time. Um, to be clear, when we talk about queue time, that's different than wait time, even though those words mean kind of the same thing. So wait time is the time between when we receive the order and we start production. Queue time is during production if the product that we're making has to sit around waiting to go into the next process, waiting to go through the next machine, something like that. That's our queue time. But again, process time is the only value added time. So when we compute manufacturing cycle efficiency, we take our value added time divided by our manufacturing cycle time, and they're reminding us value added time is just the process time. That's it. Okay, so let's try a problem. A TQM team at Narton Corp has received the following average times for production. Wait time is three days, inspection time is four days, process time is 0.2 days, move time is 0.5 days, and queue time is 9.3 days. Now, before we even dive into this, um, what do you think about this process? Do you think it's very efficient? So from the time that we received the order to when we started production took three days, and then we start production, and the actual process time the only value added time here is 0.2 days. So like a fifth of a work day, maybe like two hours. But then we have to inspect the product. So we spend 0.4 days inspecting something that only took 0.2 days to process. And then the move is 0.5 days. So if we spend half a day just moving this product around our manufacturing facility. And then queue time, 9.3 days. That's outrageous, right? So immediately just in looking at these numbers, I find this to be highly inefficient, even borderline offensive. What is this company doing with this queue time? So obviously first question, what is throughput time? So throughput time includes everything except, except what, do you remember? So throughput time is gonna include everything except for the wait time. So if we add up everything except for wait time, what do you get? Hopefully you came up with A, 10.4 days, which seems like a long time when only 0.2 days was spent on value added processes. And then of course they want you to compute your delivery cycle time. So what's delivery cycle time? Delivery cycle time is the whole thing. So all of it. So that's how throughput time and delivery cycle time differ is that we're gonna include the wait time as well. So the 10.4 days plus the wait time of three days. So now we're at a total of 13.4 days. And then finally, they want us to compute our manufacturing cycle efficiency. Immediately, I'm just gonna pick a low number because I can tell that their manufacturing cycle efficiency is pathetic. So I'm just gonna rule out A and C right away but I suppose that we should do the math and actually compute the MCE. So how would we do that? What numbers are we gonna be dividing? We're gonna divide our value added time, which is simply our process time, and we're gonna divide that by our throughput time. Do you remember what throughput time is? It was everything except wait time, right? So hopefully you came up with answer B we took process time of 0.2 days and we divided it by our throughput time of 10.4 days, which is 1.9%. And I'm going to say that's really pathetic. So management should instantly take action trying to figure out how to first reduce the queue time and then figure out how to reduce the rest of it. Because if something only takes 0.2 days to process, why in the world are we spending 0.4 days inspecting it, 0.5 days pushing it around, and we took three days just to get it started? 
don't even get me going on the 9.3 days that it's spending waiting to go through its processing that only takes 0.2 days. Something is very wrong at Narton Corp and their T TQM team apparently needs to work a little bit harder. So then our last topic is understanding how to construct and use a balanced scorecard. And I will say, I think the book overcomplicates this idea. Um, when we talk about a balanced scorecard, um, there is no scorecard. There is no actual score. Um, the idea is simply that we want to measure the performance of the company overall, given divisions or segments, and even individual employees using multiple performance measures. So management translates its strategy into performance measures that employees understand and influence. When we measure how a business is doing, it's measured, hopefully, by more than just financials, by more than just dollars. Uh, financial measures are absolutely important, and ultimately, we do need to be able to produce um, strong financial numbers, meaning good return on investment, good net income. We need to be financially successful, but what leads to financial success is also looking at some of these other measures. So we need to have a focus on customers. We might be making money now, but if our customer satisfaction is horrible, will we continue to make money in the future? Are we going to continue to be financially successful if we're not satisfying our customers? Hmm, probably not. How about learning and growth? If we don't do something to move our company forward and continue to learn and grow our company, if we sit around and let our company become stagnant, um, we might be financially successful now. But if we're not moving forward, then that may not be true in the future. Another one to consider is internal business processes. And that seems kind of strange. Um, so in terms of how we get things done and what workflow we have and what uh, processes we have to make sure things are done safely, securely, um, all kinds of factors that might go into internal business processes. And if we're not doing things correctly internally, well, we might be financially successful now, um, a failure in terms of internal business processes could lead to our demise in the future. So that's the basic idea. And really, we could stop the whole conversation there that when we talk about a balanced scorecard, it's really about um, using multiple performance measures, not just financial measures. So here we get a little more complicated. Um, with a balanced scorecard, we're going to take the company's overall vision and strategy and break it into these separate parts. So what are our financial goals? What customers do we want to serve and how are we going to win and retain them? And then what internal business processes are critical to providing value to customers? To support that, we'll need to have learning and growth. So are we maintaining our ability to change and improve, which that should aid us in our internal business processes? Have we improved key business processes so that we can deliver more value to customers? In terms of customers, do customers recognize that we are delivering more value? And then financially, has our financial performance improved? So the idea is that if we don't just say, well, we just want to make a lot of money, in the short term, that might work. But in the long term, we need to start from the bottom up, which will hopefully result in long-term financial success. So that's the idea with the balanced scorecard. But again, I point out there is no scorecard, there is no score, and really what we're talking about is using multiple performance measures and not just having tunnel vision only to look at financial results. The balanced scorecard relies on non-financial measures in addition to financial measures for two reasons. Here's the big one. Number one, financial measures are lag indicators that summarize the results of what happened in the past. When we look at financial statements, that's a summary of history. That's a summary of what happened already. So non-financial measures are what we call leading indicators of future financial performance. So as we look at our other indicators, customer satisfaction, internal business processes, our continued learning and growth, those should give us an idea if we're going to continue to be successful. Secondly, 
Top managers are ordinarily responsible for financial performance measures, not lower level managers. Non-financial measures are more likely to be understood and controlled by lower level managers. I've definitely seen a trend in business lately um, that every business wants to know if their customers are satisfied. Do you feel like you've had to take um, like a lot of different cu customer satisfaction surveys recently? It seems like businesses are really interested to know if customers are satisfied. And what we're finding out is that a lot of people are being evaluated in their work based on whether customers are satisfied because businesses acknowledge it is a leading indicator of future financial performance, keeping customers happy. So that leads to future revenues. So when we look at lower level managers and other employees, typically it's the non-financial measures that they can control and understand better at that level. So overall, the balanced scorecard for the organization and individuals, they suggest the entire organization should have an overall balanced scorecard. And each individual should have a balanced scorecard. And again, I remind you, there is no scorecard and there is no score. It simply means that we should be evaluated on multiple measures. We should measure the performance of the company on multiple measures, not just financials. We should measure and evaluate employees on multiple measures, not just financials. The personal scorecard should contain measures that can be influenced by the individual being evaluated and that support the measures in the overall balanced scorecard. So let's say an employee, they should have maybe a goal for a certain amount of sales, but they also need to have, they need to have a goal in terms of a customer satisfaction rating. So not just that they're making tons of sales, but we also need them to um, keep those customers satisfied. And they also might have some kind of professional development goals that they do a certain amount of learning and growing during, during their um, evaluation period. So the balanced scorecard should have measures that are linked together on a cause and effect basis. If we improve on one performance measure, then hopefully another desired performance measure will improve. So if we improve our customer satisfaction, then hopefully we'll make more money. So our financial results will improve. So the balanced scorecard lays out concrete actions to attain desired outcomes. So I think we've said enough about the balanced scorecard. Um, incentive compensation should be linked to balanced scorecard performance measures. That's just an idea. Um, here again, you've got the authors of the textbook putting their ideas in writing as if they are absolutely and always true. Um, I think we've hit this idea well enough. So the balanced scorecard, again, there is no scorecard and there is no score. We're just talking about multiple performance measures. Okay, good enough for me. That's the end of chapter 11. Please, of course, contact me if you need any help on the concepts in this chapter. I'm here to help you guys. All right, good luck.